Hello and welcome to another installment of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes-Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. You can communicate with us through the chat room and the Q&A box by typing your questions during the webinar, and our speaker will answer these at the end of the webinar. If you're tuning in on Facebook Live, you can send us your questions and comments using the comment feed on Facebook. You can also use the hashtag conservation conversations if you'd like to engage with us over social media or to let us know that you're tuning in tonight. And be sure to catch up on any of the previous conservation conversations webinars you may have missed on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel. Don't forget that you can support the production of these webinars by donating through the Quicket platform. You can simply scan the QR code or visit the donations website on screen. We value all of the support received so far that is helping us to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. Please remember that you can sign up for Conservation League donor competition where you stand a chance to win a brand new pair of Zeiss binoculars. If you'd like to know more, please visit our website, www.birdlife.org.za and go to the membership tab where you can find all of the details about becoming a Conservation League donor as a member of BirdLife South Africa. In exactly a month's time, BirdLife South Africa will be hosting the virtual African Bird Fair, a first for the continent and an event which promises to bring you the very best in all things birding from across our amazing continent and the world. Keep an eye on BirdLife South Africa's social media feeds and website for updates. Be sure to enter the new Jakarta Media monthly giveaway competition where you could win these four fantastic titles from Jakarta Media. Be sure to visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to enter. And we'll be announcing the, the August winner at the, the end of the last webinar of this month, which happens to be a presentation by Dr. Warwick Tarbiton and Fanny Duplessis on the Birds of Nails Flare. So be sure to tune in for that one. Now tonight, I am very excited to welcome BirdLife South Africa CEO, Mark Anderson, back to Conservation Conversations. Mark and his wife, Tanya, have dedicated a large portion of their lives to the conservation of the lesser flamingo. Mark has many insights to share about these beautiful birds, and being a very talented photographer, I have no doubt that this will be a visually appealing affair. Thanks for joining us tonight, boss. We look forward to your talk tonight, and I will enjoy handing over to you to take over. Please share your presentation with us. Okay, can you see it, Melissa? Yes, we can, Mark. Okay, I'm going to fire away. So thanks, Melissa. Thanks very much for the introduction. And it's a, a pleasure to um, present a talk about uh, Kimberley's Pink Gems, uh, those are flamingos of Camphis Dam. So this is going to be a, a, a talk with lots of slides. I'm going to go through lots of slides. And I sincerely hope that you enjoy it. So the talk is about this species, one of two species of flamingos that occur in Africa, the Mesa flamingo. I'd like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Dr. Richard Liversidge, who's been gone uh, almost 17 years. And when Tanya and I moved to Kimberley in uh, the end of 1988, he was um, our mentor and friend and our Kimberley father for you know, the bulk of um, those subsequent few years. And it was Richard that introduced me to the Lesser Flamingos at uh, Campus Down. So, yeah, Richard, thank you about you today. Thanks for all you did for both Tanya and I, and in fact for our children. And then uh, up front, I just want to acknowledge the significant contributions that have been made to the conservation of flamingos at Campus Dam over the years, and particularly to copper mining, who have been outstanding for well over 15 years for all they've done, all of the support, financial support that they've given to the to the work at Campus Dam. And then to the landowners, uh, Herbert Rancher, as we know him, and Brenda Booth, who are the custodians of Campus Dam and its flamingos. And they've done an outstanding job looking after the birds over many, many decades. And then lastly, and importantly, to Tanya. I've got very busy in the last 12 years, and Tanya has taken over the role of coordinating all things flamingo and certainly keeping good records of all the information that is collated about lesser flamingos at Campus Dam and even further afield. And actually telling her the other day, I don't think there's anybody that knows as much about this flamingos as she does. Okay, so there's three components to the talk. I'm firstly going to tell you all about lesser flamingos, lesser flamingo 101, just some basic information. I'm going to focus about on lesser flamingo conservation, but particularly the work we've done at Campus Dam. 
little bit about the threats, and then lastly, something about the rescue operation that um, was undertaken last year. And then just finally, just a couple of slides ending with a few points about BirdLife South Africa. Okay, the first bit, Flamingos 101. Now, there was a slide that Melissa was showing before the presentation started of the six species of flamingos in the world. We have two species in Africa, the greater and lesser flamingo. The other four are found in the Americas. And Tanya and I were in South America last year and very fortunate to see the South American flamingo species. Okay, those are the two that occur in Africa, the greater and the lesser. The greater being larger, generally paler, the lesser being smaller and generally pinker. Now the foolproof way of telling these two species apart is by looking at the color of the bull. On the right, there's a lesser flamingo, with a dark bull, and the less, left is a young, greater flamingo with a light bull with a dark tip. If you can see the bull and you can tell whether it's all dark or just as a dark tip, you can tell the difference between the two species. Not everybody um, is able to initially. And I have to say that the flamingo on the right, the lesser flamingo, that was an absolute bonus for me one day. I was sitting in my little portable hide at Campus Dam, and uh, this bird walked up to the hide and just sat there for a long time doing a bit of preening and enabled me in perfect light to get a whole sequence of images of this uh, beautiful bird. Okay, just some more about the biology of the lesser flamingo, but first to understand where it occurs. There's a map of Africa from Leslie Brown et al's book, published way back in 1982, Birds of Africa. You can see the shaded area. This flamingo occurs, occurs throughout Southern Africa, up into East Africa through the Great Rift Valley, marginally in West Africa, and also in parts of South Asia. But very importantly about the species, despite this wide distribution, until recently it only bred at those three localities that I've marked in red. That's Lake Natron in Northern Tanzania, Suapan in Botswana, and Toshapan in Namibia. This is a, an old map, but I still think a useful one. It's the lesser flamingo distribution from the first atlas. And you can see where the range sort of extends across our region, really centered on the central plateau of South Africa. And then you can see the records around Botswana, around the Makhadi Khadi Pans, Suapan, and the other pan, and then Tosha, Namibia, and then the, along the coast. Okay, so these birds move around a lot, and the, the movement's actually quite interesting and something that's not well understood, but I think through some of the recent research has been understood a little bit better. They fly at night, so you'll never see a flamingo commuting between two wetlands during the day, or very seldom so. They fly at night, and they fly very far at night, fly at about 60, 70 kilometers an hour, and they will cover many hundred kilometers in a night. And Graham McCulloch's um, initial tracking showed um, that the birds will move vast distances between these different wetlands. And this is in fact some of Graham's work, it's some of um, the early work that he did, showing the movements of the birds that he satellite tagged at uh, Suapan, one of the Makhadi Khadi pans in Botswana. You can see some of those birds came to Campus Dam, some of them went across to Belkum, some went to, to Mozambique, across to Namibia. So there are extensive movements in Southern Africa. Now this is more recent work, and this is work that Doug Hairbottle and his team have been doing at Kimberley. Some of the lesser flamingos that were rescued and released have been marked with uh, colorings and also with satellite tags, and you can see the dispersal of those birds right across the country. They're actually quite nomadic, and they move around in response to favorable conditions. And I'm hoping that Doug, or I'm sure Doug will produce a, a really nice paper at the end of this study to actually show us how these birds disperse across um, the landscape in our region. See the bottom figure there shows one of the early birds that was ringed with a coloring, and you can see the yellow coloring. It was seen in Namibia, Ludrit, by Jessica Kemp, Kemper. And she um, observed this bird. There was an interesting movement because the bird was still a juvenile, and how it knew after being reared in captivity to undertake that um, movement is uh, really interesting. And even more interesting is this record from Matt Pretorius of the Endangered Wildlife Trust, where he satellite tracked a lesser flamingo from Delarayville all the way across the Mozambique Channel um, to Madagascar. So they certainly move around quite extensively. But we don't know much about movements between Southern Africa and East Africa. The bulk of the lesser flamingo population in the millions occurs in East Africa, and we only have 100,000 plus in Southern Africa. There's no evidence of any movement between the two regions. Certainly no recoveries of ring birds and no movement of satellite tag birds. But we do know that at times the populations fluctuate and there's been suggestions by Tim Lewis, Liversidge in particular in Botswana that vast numbers have been recorded from Khadi Khadi Pans. 
and he felt that those were an influx from East Africa. Also, the genetic work shows that the populations are similar. So there are almost certainly movements between the, new, the two regions, but no evidence for it yet. There was this very, very interesting recovery. Um, Leslie Brown, the very famous ornithologist, ringed a whole lot of lesser flamingos at Lake Magadi in 1962. One was recovered in Western Sahara, what's that, 35 years later, traveling over 6,000 kilometers. Those show that they do move around very extensively. Okay, the breeding localities in Southern Africa are really interesting. And as I showed in an earlier slide, these the flamingos, the, the sort of pink circles, they breed successfully the Toshapan and Suapan and Botswana. And they have attempted to breed at a few other localities in South Africa. But greater flamingos, the blue circles, they bred at a number of places. Greater flamingos breeding requirements are far less uh, specific than, than lesser flamingos. Just some historical photos taken way back when. This is a breeding event at Etosha Pan where you get these mass breeding events. And I think a lot of people will know and would have seen some of the documentaries about these tracks that the young birds do when the pans start drying up. They will track tens of kilometers to, to um, the available water. Many are sort of dying in, in the process. Like the this flamingo in Africa is unfortunately threatened by a number of factors. In East Africa, there's a number of threats. Um, algal toxins are a problem, toxic heavy metals. Lake Natron, the most important site for lesser flamingos in the world, is threatened because of it's unprotected. And there was a soda ash plant um, proposed for the shoreline of Lake Natron. And there's also problems at Etoshapan and Suapan. But overall, wetland degradation, I think, is the biggest problem for flamingos. And this will become evident when I speak about Campus Dam. There's been no mass die-offs of flamingos in Southern Africa as there has been in East Africa. And still, I don't think the causes of those um, die-offs in East Africa have been well determined, thought to be something related to algal toxins and perhaps. Okay, there are very few natural mortality factors. And I was really interested in this work that Graham McCulloch did years ago, and he published this in Vulture News and perhaps elsewhere, that lapid-faced vultures go in and depredate on the young lesser flamingo chicks at Mahari Hari Pans, at, at um, Suapan, when the birds breed there. And we know that fish eagles are also predators of lesser flamingo chicks. At Campus Dam, we've witnessed that a number of times over the years. Okay, so the population size of lesser flamingos is very large. Numbers in the millions, we're not sure how many. And uh, BirdLife South Africa's Robin Kalane, who heads up our science and innovation program, has some very clever ideas about doing remote surveys to try and finally get a number of the lesser flamingos in Africa. We'd like to thank the Gaia Zoo in Holland for supporting that work. In Southern Africa, we estimate that there's about 100,000 birds, perhaps um, a bit more, 120,000 maybe, it's still also not accurately known. Lesa flamingo is listed both globally and regionally as near threatened, and that's the, South Af the regional red data book, the edition that was uh, most recently published, which we hope to revise soon. And the reason for the threats, are clearly not because of the numbers, they number in the millions, the reason is because they have very few sites at which, at which they breed. Okay, now moving on to the second part of the talk, and that's to talk about lesser flamingo conservation at Campus Dam. I think most of you will know where Campus Dam is located. It's uh, right step bang in the middle of the country. In fact, if you, Kimberley is right in the middle of the country, and if you balance a map of South Africa on a pin, it kind of balances just west of Kimberley. So Kimberley right in the middle of the country, and it's a place that Tanya and I called home for 24 years. So the pan is, or dam is located just north of Kimberley. It's in private ownership. It's a natural heritage site, it's an important bird and biodiversity area, and it was almost registered as a Ramsar site, um, which is international recognition for wetlands that are important for water birds and for fish. Okay, there's a Google image, and you can see the city of Kimberley, the northern parts of that image, and then Campus Dam, the, the green area. It shows up as green because of the large um, concentration of algae in the water. To the west of Campus Dam, you can see there's also residential areas. So there are a lot of people that live in very close um, proximity to Campus Dam. And initially, we weren't sure how many flamingos we had at Campus Dam. And for many, many years, I did uh, surveys. I used to walk around the dam and count the flamingos. Really difficult to do, as you can imagine, looking at that image. But working with some colleagues um, from Denmark, Jeff Groom and Ich um, Krach-Peterson in particular, we did a, a survey using 
aerial photographs, very high resolution images that were taken by from an airplane. This work was sponsored by Copper Mining. And we were able to determine using this remote method and an object-based analysis that there were 81,664 lesser flamingos on that at Campus Dam on that day in May 2006. In fact, there wasn't 81,665, 663. We knew exactly how many flamingos were at Campus Dam on that day. That is a really important population of lesser flamingos and probably the, the most important permanent population in Southern Africa. Now Robin Kalein, BirdLife South Africa's Robin Kalein, is going to be replicating this work. He has already done some work, but we're hoping that we can actually get better estimates of numbers in both Southern Africa and, our, and Africa using the same um, remote methods. Guess what it looks like at uh, Comfort Dam, particularly in the morning. That's the Flamingo Casino in the background, and these birds are out feeding. It really is an incredible spectacle to see such large numbers of flamingos. I've been very fortunate over the years to visit Lake Nakuru, National Park in Kenya on a few occasions, and looking down onto the lake, one sees similar spectacles. It's not easy to get to Lake Nakuru, You've got to drive up from Nairobi, the road is not great, lots of traffic, and you see similar sort of spectacle, and it's actually surprising that we haven't exploited this opportunity more. What they're feeding on are two things, blue-green algae and diatoms, so diatoms. And the reason they are so frequent, so numerous, and in this water is through nutrient enrichment. Similarly, campus dam water comes from the sewage works. This water has been partially treated, untreated at times, as I'll talk about later. And that's why we have this large number of flamingos at campus dam, is that there is a really incredible concentration of blue-green algae and diatoms in the, in the water. And I included that photograph in the presentation because this is that same bird I showed earlier, but the, the beak is open. And you can see the lamellae in the beak and the birds um, filter the water, filter the, the um, food out of the water, but much like baleen whales do when they feed on um, plankton. Here's a few photographs of, of Kimberley, and you can see flamingos in the middle with uh, so-called skyscrapers in the background. Kimberley's famous for a number of things, the big hole, importantly, the diamonds, sparkling gems of Kimberley, the Honor Dead Memorial, top right, the McGregor Museum, bottom left. But I do think a lot more needs to be done to promote um, the Flamingos at Campus Dam. It really is an um, important um, ecotourism um, opportunity that hasn't unfortunately been realized. And flamingos are very famous in Kimberley. If you walk down the streets of Kimberley and ask anybody about Campus Dam and its flamingos, they will tell you they know about them. You can see top left, uh, there's a flamingo in the emblem of the Solplaiki municipality. Bottom right, they're in the emblem of the Francis Park District municipality. And then on the right, we've got the Flamingo Casino, and there's some bronze flamingos in the that pond in the entrance to the casino. So just to summarize, Campus Dam, Stessa Flamingos, uh, yeah, population is really important. Could be the largest permanent population in Southern Africa, but I think it almost certainly is. The most important feeding locality, more than 80,000 birds at times, and probably surpasses 100,000 at times. And both species, greater and lesser, have attempted to breed in the past, constructed about two and a half thousand nests. But the, the problem, the great problem for this species is that despite that range across the continent, there are only those three breeding localities. Um, there were only those three breeding localities. As I mentioned, Lake Natron in Tanzania, Tasha in Namibia, and Suipan in Botswana. The other three lighter shade areas are where they've bred in the past. Um, so for example, the one just above Lake Natron is Lake Magadi in Kenya, in southern Kenya, where they bred just once. And that happened to be when Lake Natron flooded. A lot of rainfall in East Africa, Lake Magadi, and received some water, very infrequently gets inundated. That's when the lesser flamingos spread there. So the species, um, despite numbering in the millions, literally has its eggs in way too few baskets. So how can we help them? Um, well, the, the way to do it was, is to establish a new breeding site. And how one could do that is construct a flamingo breeding island. This is something that's not new. It's been done very successfully in the Camargue and the Rhone Delta in Southern France where Alan Johnson Decades ago, constructed a, an island for greater flamingos, and they've bred many years um, subsequently. And its idea wasn't um, unique even for Southern Africa. Dr. Rob Simmons proposed a breeding island for Etosha. Dr. Warwick Tarbiton proposed one for Chrissy Smear, but those were never realized. Now, I can't remember in 1995 who I spoke to. It could have been Warwick, perhaps even Rob, about a breeding island for Campus Dam. Something was suggested, 
but it was only in later discussions, 10 years later, with the copper mining and with Peter Honey in particular, that um, we, this um, idea came up again. In fact, Peter asked me what we could do to assist Campus Dam and its flamingos, and I proposed the island, and in fact, um, he, I put in a proposal later that day. He received board approval, and uh, island's construction commenced the following year, partly because we had to receive the necessary environmental authorizations. Now, what constitutes ideal lesser flamingo breeding habitat? Certainly not that there, um, with an umbrella and a happy flamingo. Um, but you look at the places where they do breed, they are vast, vast pans and lakes, and generally dry, but in the summer months, they're inundated with water, just a few inches of water. So to replicate that at Campus Dam was not ever going to be easy. Campus Dam is about 500 hectares in size. The water is actually quite deep. It could be you know, a meter and a half in the middle. So very deep and very, very unlike um, the, the areas where the bird naturally breeds. So we were going to take a chance by um, building this island at huge expense and certainly hope that it would be successful. So there again is Campus Dam closer up and you can see the Homevale sewage works from where the dam receives its water. Flamingo Casino, the N12 road, which is the main road between Johannesburg and Kimberley. And top north is the game farm. This is the Booth property. The Booths own most of Campus Dam and the property to the north of, of Campus Dam. And those two areas there are the two areas where the flamingos have in the past built nest turrets and have attempted to breed, but been unsuccessful. And the reason they were unsuccessful, we believe, is that there was just too much disturbance. Disturbance by dogs, that site in the west. In the site in the east, we often found that people would climb over the, the railway line and over the fence and try and get close to take photographs. And I think that uh, probably caused disturbance and they never bred um, successfully. So this is where we decided to build this flamingo island. And this is actually a more recent image. So some of the island has eroded away. But you can see it's uh, way north, northern part of Campus Dam. And we wanted to get it away from any form of human disturbance. And the Booth family committed to um, look after the, the, the project and also at times ensure that the property was inaccessible to, to people if the, we felt that the birds were um, at a sensitive stage of breeding. Okay, this is the, the island um, after construction and you can see it now already in, um, occupied by a fair number, a very large number of flamingos. A little bit about the dimensions, it was a particularly large island, 250 meters long, 25 meters wide. Now, the reason for the S shape is that we have a very strong prevailing wind that blows from the north. And the, the view, and this is Jean Honey's view, um, the MD of the copper mining, was that an S shape would limit the area that was exposed to wind and particularly to water erosion. If you think about that, yeah, that's exactly the case. A very clever idea that Jean proposed, and I think we almost developed the ideal model for a Flamingo Island. There was also a high lying area that I've indicated there where we thought if the birds did escape, that need to escape if the dam flooded, the island flooded, they could then escape to that high-lying area. And there were also two sheltered bays, sheltered from the wind, and also um, with a more gentle slope that the flamingo chicks could get on and off. So we really thought about everything. We also were concerned, and this was something that was discussed fairly later on the, in the project, that because the island was constructed from calcrete, the birds, they build these nest turrets that look a bit like a sand castle, the one we build on the beach, they wouldn't be able to use the calcrete to construct those nest turrets. So we topped the island with about 300 millimeters of, of clay. And um, Jean one day asked me whether the birds would use dry clay to build their nest turrets, and we thought probably not. So we constructed four very large ponds on the northern side of the island. And these were filled with water from a submerged pump that was powered by solar panels on the mainland. So water flows, flowed through those ponds on a continual basis. And I think those ponds were very important for the, um, the project. We also got funding um, from Nedbank and uh, worked with um, AFRICAM to put up a webcam on the island about there. And this webcam it, um, had sound as well um, and uh, was, uh, we were able to 24 seven show people what was happening on the island. Okay, September 2006, and it's hard to believe that that's almost 14 years ago, island construction started. So we initially had to build this causeway out to where the island would be built. And the copper mining at that stage were actually doing some work on the, the mining operations. They're a very green mining company. They mine the old tailings. 
And they put a lot of the equipment on this project. So you can see the um, causeway under construction. And uh, we, um, Peter Honey and I went in, in a canoe and put these markers in the dam to mark the circumference of the island. So the team knew where to, to dump the, the material, the culprit. They worked 24 seven, so they worked through the nights. So we installed our, um, lights on the, on the causeway and on the island. There's some more images of all of the machinery that was used to construct this island. We were also still concerned about erosion. So we managed to get some alluvial rock from the Val River um, alluvial diamond mining operations. And that was packed on the, the windward side of the island. In fact, there was still erosion after that. And later on, we went and packed sandbags onto the island. So one of my roles during this whole project was to just monitor the effects of the, all the activity on the flamingos. You can see the island starting to take shape there. Um, the clay topping has not been placed on top of the island. But in the back, you can see all of those flamingos as well. So they didn't seem to be too phased or disturbed by the activities on the island. There, the island is starting to take shape, which is um, really nice. Um, you can see the S shape, the causeway is still intact. It was removed shortly afterwards. Now, this image always reminds me to tell you two things, perhaps three things. One is that it reminds me of a dollar sign. If you push the causeway through the S, it's a bit like a dollar. People often want to know how much it costs to build this island. You know, copper mining provided the machinery, but the estimate is that the project cost about a million rand. And remember, this is 14 years ago, so it would be a more expensive operation today. The other thing it reminds me of to tell you is that the island is actually visible from the air. And I regularly, well, not during COVID, but certainly before COVID, fly between Joburg and Cape Town. We have 10 meetings and interact with our staff. And I remember one flight with Roger Ford, who used to fly for Kalula since uh, left. He actually very kindly, and unknown to me, um, well, I, I've never met him before, spoke about the island as we flew over um, Kimberley. And he got all the facts right. And I went and spoke to him afterwards, and he's become a great bird life South Africa supporter subsequently. So the, the um, island is visible from, um, from aircraft, and also, I believe, visible from space. Now, we thought that we'd um, build some more islands, because the S-shaped island is quite good. We perhaps build another S, there's a good design, and maybe build an O-shaped island. There's some ideas for an O-shaped island. And we'd have an SOS. We thought it'd be a, quite a nice call from flamingos calling to, for assistance because of uh, all the problems that they're enduring currently in Africa. Okay, believe it or not, the entire project, the construction, took 11 days. So you can see there, day one to four was construction of the causeway. Day four to seven, construction of the island. Day seven to 10, the island topping with clay, the construction of the ponds. And day 10, then we did a little bit of work with some Boy Scouts and Girl Guides. We built some artificial nest turrets. Then we had the official opening, um, which was opened by the Premier of the Northern Cape um, at that time. So 11 days, it's just incredible what a, a committed company such as Ekapa Mining can achieve in such a relatively short uh, space of time. So the, uh, the island opening was an interesting affair. It was in September. and uh, Late afternoon, we saw this bank of clouds in the southwest, and uh, it was the imminent arrival of a cold front, last cold front of the year. We were going to have the opening on the island. We decided not to. We had it in the gravel pit from where the culprit had been excavated, and the premier of the Northern Cape at that stage, De Pure Peters, um, basically opened the island, and I had to offer a blanket because it was so cold as this cold front hit us. Okay, shortly afterwards, in fact, I was in Tanzania, work, or in Kenya, working on vultures um, with Simon Thompson, Munir Varani, and, and Rob Simmons. And I remained in frequent contact with Rancher Booth, the landowner. I remember one of the WhatsApp or SMS messages he sent me. I was in the Masamara, and he said there were some flamingos on the island. He was quite chuffed that there were flamingos. And I was really excited that they'd actually so quickly accepted the, the island. When I returned um, to South Africa a few weeks later, that's the site that kind of greeted me, was um, the island was occupied by many, many thousands of flamingos. So clearly they would accepted the site and were very happy to make use of it, but unfortunately only for roosting purposes. A few months later, the flamingos left the island, and Peter Honey and I canoed across to see what they'd been up to, and we found that they laid a few eggs, very few eggs, but they deserted the island completely. And then for four months the following year, May to August 2007, they didn't use the island at all. And in that image, you can see the, the large ponds that we constructed and also the, the nest turrets. And the ones in the ponds are the ones that the flamingos constructed themselves. So this um, 
it was interesting living in Kimberley and having spent a you know, million rand on a, on a project, which some people consider to be a white elephant, that um, you know, it was never going to be successful and we really wasted our time and efforts. But September 2007, the birds moved back en masse, the image I showed earlier. It was very tough to see all of the flamingos on the, the island. Then in October, November 2007, we saw some behavior that we'd never previously recorded at Campus Dam. Especially the birds were very pink, developed very pink plumage. And they did this head flagging display. So we thought we were onto something. But uh, what happened then in December and early January, um, most people who can do so leave Kimberley to, to evade the heat. Kimberley is not the, the coolest place in South Africa. And in fact, everybody that was involved in this project, the, the Honey Brothers, um, the Booths, and the Andersons, left Kimberley for a few weeks. And we were down at Sedgefield at the family cottage and every day wondered what the birds were up to because we were very excited about whether this courtship behavior we'd seen it would lead to breeding. We returned um, to Kimberley on the 2nd of January, Tony and I with our children, and we didn't even unpack the car. We were so eager to get out to Campus Dam to see what the birds had been up to. And we had a viewing site with a um, screen on the top of a little hill overlooking the, the, the island, and I was putting my spotting scope together, and Tanya was looking through my binoculars, and she looked down at the island and turned to me with a smile, and she said, I think I see something. And what she'd seen was a few baby flamingos, and you can see them in that uh, photograph as well. I can't remember how we, we counted that day. There was maybe six or ten. There weren't many. We were really excited, and um, I think I made 17 phone calls from there, including to the then um, MEC, Peter Simon, MEC for Nature Conservation, telling them all of the, the good news. And um, We left there in the dark, Tanya and I, and uh, had no food in the house because we'd been away for a few weeks, and uh, went home via the spa, at the, horse, the horseshoe spa, picked up a cake and a bottle of champagne, Got home and our kids had cake for dinner and, and our daughter, Stephanie, had I think her first glass of champagne to celebrate the success. Late January, there were more chicks. In March 2008, there were 9,000 chicks. We were just blown away by how successful this project had been. So we, we knew how many chicks there were because Peter Honey, who's a helicopter pilot, has his own helicopter, and I used to fly over the island once a month. We'd fly over very high, um, first for the flamingos to get used to us, and then we'd fly past uh, very fast, about 600 foot, and I would take a series of very high resolution photographs hanging out the helicopter. And for those who know me know that I'm terribly scared of heights and flying, we managed to do this, and then Tanya and I would work through those images in Photoshop, and we'd count each individual bird. We'd count the eggs, the young birds, the adult birds, and um, we were able to get very accurate counts of the flamingos on the island. And you can see later, these are, birds that had been produced on the, on the island and getting larger and even flying as well. So this was a great success, we believe, because we'd established the fourth breeding locality for the species in Africa. First time they'd ever bred in South Africa in historical times. And so, you know, we were quite chuffed uh, with the result. They then bred the following year and even more successfully, this time 13,000 chicks. So as you can see there in the top box, um, they now bred during two consecutive years, which was really exciting for us. And Rob Simmons' work in Namibia, and Tasha, showed that they breed successfully there on average every nine years. I think even less frequently these days. So they bred for four consecutive years, 9,000, then 13,000, then 800, then about 100 chicks, and then they stopped breeding. And the reason for that is because the water levels in the dam decreased and the island unfortunately flooded. I have some images of that in a moment. The project received lots and lots of publicity. There were lots of articles, not only in local newspapers and magazines, but even internationally. And the webcam was, was a great success. The webcam was Tanya's responsibility. She would um, set up little views so that there would be a wide angle shot of part of the island and close ups of some of the, the chicks and um, some of the nests. And you can see that image on the bottom right. There's a very, very cute disciplinary chick on its nest being looked after by its, uh, one of its parents. And we worked with AfriCam on this project and the images were shown around the world. We had people contacting us from all over the world saying how excited they were to watch the flamingos. The project also received a number of awards. In top left there in the middle, you can see that's Peter Honey, who is one of the directors of Ecarpa Mining and that was a Nedbank um, Green Capital Mining Award, I think it was called, that um, his company received for the project. So really, very really exciting. But top right is an OWL award that I received for the project. And Little did I know that one day I'd be working for BirdLife South Africa. Okay, fortunately, there's been a lot of problems with Campus Dam over the years, and 
We've been very concerned about these problems. And these have largely, well, initially in particular, been addressed by a little group that we established in Kimberley called the Save the Flamingo Association. And there were a number of representatives on that association, including the Copper Mining, um, the Wildlife and Environment Society, the Booth family. And the threats that we tried to address were the dysfunctional sewage works, which unfortunately remains dysfunctional today, and the poor quality water that was flowing into the, the dam, at times absolutely untreated. Too much water, we spoke a moment ago about the flooding of the, of the island, pollutants, coliform bacteria, which we believe could affect the birds. And then also we later we picked up avian pox virus in a large number of the, the young flamingos, even some of the adult flamingos. And then housing developments, which we, we did believe were located too close to, were proposed to be located too close to the, the dam and to the island. And in collisions with the, the um, electrical infrastructure that surrounds um, the dam. Okay, so just a couple of pictures of some of these threats. And that on the right, top right, is actually the Home Vale Sewage Works. On the left of the railway line is Campus Dam. The water on the right of the railway line is raw sewage, essentially, it's just flowing into the felt. Absolutely dreadful that this was allowed to happen. And I mentioned earlier in one of the slides that the communities are living very close uh, to Campus Dam. And at times, the, the smells are absolutely awful. And these poor people have to live in this environment where there's this, this stench, but really concerning. And when the water levels rose, the, um, even rose higher up than this, and the railway line became vulnerable, and the um, Transnet, Spurnet, actually stopped using that railway line, which is apparently the most lucrative railway line in South Africa. It's the main manganese line between Possensburg and Port Elizabeth. We also picked up this avian pox virus in the list of flamingos. We, we wrote about this, published in Journal of Wildlife Diseases. David Zimmerman, the sand fox vet, led on the study. And that's something we'd never previously observed at Campus Dam until the water quality started deteriorating. These, um, this virus is actually spread by biting insects, which we believe were proliferating in this, this very dirty um, water. And then uh, very, very sadly, the island flooded with the rising water. And with, through the webcam, Tanya was actually able to document this um, photograph it, and you can see the nest turrets now surrounded by lots of water. She even filmed um, little flamingo chicks drowning, one on the right, for example. Very little we could do about that, unfortunately, but the water level rose and, and caused these problems. And the water levels weren't being managed uh, to the extent that we would have liked. And it's not only the, the fact that the sewage water was having an effect, but also about 50%, in fact, probably more of Kimberley's treated water that's treated the Riverton um, treatment works on the Vaal River actually loses its way into the stormwater system through leaking pipes. So there was sewage water and drinking water, potable water that was ending up in Campus Dam. And you can see there as the island flooded. The high lying area that I spoke about earlier is visible and maybe fulfilled the purpose that it was intended for. Okay, then another problem we had was this housing development proposed by a company called Group One, a Western Cape based company. And they wanted to build this housing development called Northgate. And the red area in the top left is where they wanted to build this housing development. And I think the closest to the dam was about 230 meters. And there were thousands of people that proposed to live in this area. And I can't remember the exact number, but it was about 20,000 people that were going to be living there. And uh, something we didn't get too excited about because we now had an internationally important site where lesser flamingos were breeding something we should certainly wanted to um, stop. And you know, one thing that Kimberley's not short of is space. And there's lots of space, you know, why they chose that site, um, you know, just uh, it was not obvious to us. Okay, I got a little bit involved with making, providing comments as one of the nature conservation um, scientists. And uh, at a public meeting, I was asked by Brenda Booth whether I thought that the development, the housing development would be good for the flamingos and I stood up there were a few politicians in the audience and I said, no, I don't think it would be good for them. It would be quite unfortunate. There was then a complaint from the developer that we, um, me and two of my colleagues, Julius Kuhn, my boss, and Eric Herman, one of my colleagues, would influence the outcome of the environmental impact assessment. So we were marched out of our offices on the 4th of August, uh, 2008, and told that we need to go and sit at home because we were influenced, we potentially influenced the outcome of this um, development. But we didn't take the matter lying down. Um, we at that stage were using environmental lawyers to fight um, the municipality to try and rectify some of the problems at Campus Dam. But also, I ended up um, in court fighting the my bosses 
Department of Environment and Nature Conservation um, in the High Court. They appealed in the High Court, they lost. We went to the, they went to the Supreme Court and they lost, and every time they lost with uh, cost. So um, they were fighting a, a futile battle. All I was doing and my colleagues were doing was doing our job, was to ensure that our natural environment um, was protected. But in fact, at that time, I'd already indicated to our direct, Deputy Director General, Patience Mukhale, that I was uh, leaving the Department of Nature Conservation and moving to BirdLife South Africa. Um, and um, so it was actually surprising that they implemented the actions that they did. But subsequent to moving to and taking up my position at BirdLife South Africa, I wasn't as involved, haven't been as involved with the project as I was for a large you know, decades, literally. It's been, I've uh, got a very different role now in conservation, but Tonya and others have you know, taken over and um, he's tried their best to coordinate things um, remotely. What then happened after the initial flooding um, is the dam dried up. And you can see that image there. I can't remember exactly when that image was taken, but you can see there's a totally dried dam, um, a little bit of water maybe in the, in the southwestern um, southern corner. You can actually see the island exposed there as well. And the municipality was criticized for what had happened. And you can see the Sol, which is Sol Plaque -like municipality, slam for Flamingo crisis. Koho, which is the pump station, which pumps water from the city to the sewage works, um, comes back to haunt Gulam. Gulam Akawari was the, um, the municipal manager of the Sol Plaque -like municipality at that stage. And the reason why no water was flowing into Campus Dam is it was all flowing into the felt. And just west of Kimberley, there's a magnificent property called by called Plotfontein, which is owned by the sand community. And there's the most incredible um, pristine pans, or they previously pristine pans, a whole sequence of pans that occur on this, this really beautiful game farm. And what was happening is that water was leaking through malfunctioning pump stations and leaking pipes into the felt and probably destroyed those pans forever. Those pans, in fact, according to Professor Jenny Day, I visited there with her once, she said they probably had a unique invertebrate, that probably endemic to those pans. But uh, there was a constant inflow of raw sewage into the felt and into those pristine pans, which is almost certainly destroyed them, 20 megalitres a day. Okay, then uh, after the initial period of um, the pan being dry, some, uh, some of the problems were rectified, more water flowed into the dam, and surprisingly, um, out of the blue, 2017, 2018 summer, the birds bred. And they were not, not on the island because the island had actually been damaged when it was flooded. The um, calcrete layer had washed away. And but very, very surprisingly in the, the um, western, southwestern corner of the dam, on the shoreline, the um, birds bred and they bred successfully. And this an image that Tanya took from Peter Honey's helicopter. Tanya has regularly flown with Peter over the dam, taken images just to try and get some idea of what the, the birds are up to. So 8,000 chicks were produced. And obviously we were overjoyed. But the birds are now bred and bred on their own. And clearly I think we were responsible for this by constructing the island originally. The birds had thought maybe this is actually you know, a good home. They then bred again during the following summer. And again, this is a picture taken by Tanya. Um, there were 10,000 adults on the nests and in the breeding area, about a thousand chicks with pressures were determined, were observed on the 14th of January. Then uh, a few days later, um, Dr. Doug Hairbottle did his coordinated water bird count of the campus dam, walked around and observed some chicks. And um, four days later, it uh, was determined that some of the nests had been abandoned, possibly due to dog disturbance. So there was some concern. It was then decided um, during the period 24th to 27th of January that a rescue operation should be mounted and 2,000 nestlings and pipping eggs were rescued. Um, subsequently, the, the colony stabilized um, and the birds continued breeding despite them being um, away from the water. There were then um, two more incursions, if we can call that, into the colony to harvest more eggs, birds that was uh, eggs that were thought to be deserted and uh, we advised that this wasn't a, a good idea um, but nevertheless it went ahead and then um, subsequently for the next two weeks the colony remained productive and stable as despite the fact that the water levels um, fluctuated 16th of february there were 350 adults on nest and 5200 chicks 
At this stage, BirdLife South Africa thought we need to be involved, particularly looking after those 5,000 plus um, chicks. 17th of February, there was a subsequent abandonment, and this time it was probably due to dog predation. In fact, there were dog tracks amongst the breeding colony. Now, dogs access the dam from the western side, from the, from the, the urban area that uh, was found on the western side of the dam. The breeding then ended. There was a final rescue of pipping eggs, and uh, about 25 were, were collected. The, um, we then determined um, later that month that the that adults were feeding the 5,200 plus chicks in creations in the breeding area. So BirdLife South Africa wasn't involved in the rescue of those um, birds, those chicks and the eggs, because that's not what BirdLife South Africa does. We work with uh, you know, wild birds and particularly looking after the habitat. But we did decide um, with support from a copper mining to do daily monitoring for a period of the whole of February and the whole of March, and particularly to look after those 5,200 chicks to ensure that they would uh, successfully fledge. And we had a number, there are a number of reasons why. Um, we thought that if we were there on site, we could advise whether an additional or further rescue operation was needed, and also um, keep you know, scru unscrupulous people away. Word had spread that there were flamingos breeding at Campus Dam and the other site is quite accessible. We were worried that people would get in and uh, come and um, steal some of those flamingos. So the monitoring continued and a number of people were involved. Um, Tonio spent the bulk of those two months there, but um, Andrew Jenkins, Robin Kalane, and Eric Herman assisted. And we do also appreciate the great support we got from the Booth family during that, that period. At that time, we also decided that, you know, one must look at remote ways to survey the, um, the birds, remote methods. And Robin Kalane, the head of BirdLife South Africa's Science and Innovation Program, a very clever young man, is uh, very good at developing remote methods for um, conducting surveys. So using a helicopter and a drone, he was able to take very high-risk images of the flamingos in the dam and be able to get accurate counts of both the adults and young birds, but very importantly also to do some work on the um, water quality. Also did some water sampling, and Dr. Jan Roos and Esther from the Vestas and Kutzer took some samples, and these were analyzed. Okay, so we've obviously been very concerned because um, water level had declined, had decreased, and uh, the birds you know, were, were vulnerable to these fluctuations. And you know, so largely as a result of the, the poor management of the infrastructure in Kimberley. And the copper mining did a really incredible service to not only the community of Kimberley, South Lake municipality, but also to us as conservationists and to the flamingos in assisting the municipality with the repairs to the pump stations and to the sewage pipelines. So and they really climbed in and worked day and night and got a lot of the problems sorted out. Then very, very fortunately, on the 11th of March, 100 millimeters of rain fell. And um, we knew at that stage that there was more than enough water for the breeding event to proceed um, without any um, risk of it, the chicks being abandoned. So we ended our monitoring on the 30th of March and we were very happy that the 5,000 chicks were fledged, would fledge and, and were safe. Okay, just a picture just to show you of some of the remote work that Robin Kalane has been doing. He's been developing um, computer models to monitor the algal concentration. So it's, he uses satellite images to determine how much algae is in the water and we are able to really track um, over time how suitable Campus Dam is for flamingos. In fact, the, the remote work that he's been doing tallies very well with the numbers of flamingos at um, Campus Dam. And we can actually even predict or preempt changes that are going to take place. At the moment, Robin is working ex on expanding this, this research that he's been doing to other pans and lakes and dams and wetlands across not only Southern Africa, but into East Africa. And importantly, we're now looking at using satellite imagery as well to get accurate um, flamingo counts. Okay, so then just uh, a few more slides about the rescue, rearing, and release of the lesser flamingos. Um, these are exceptionally cute birds, and I think you'll all agree. Um, it's always been debated whether it was the rescue operation was necessary or not. Um, I think that you know, possibly was, and you know, certainly the team that undertook the rescue operation, and I must speak specifically um, for the, the folk in Kimberley, I think they did an absolutely sterling job and really climbed in and committed lots and lots of time and effort into, into this work. And they really need to be commended for it. I think a lot has been learned in the process and if a rescue operation is ever needed in the future, I think a lot has been learned. And yes, some more images 
of the rescue and the rearing of these birds. And it received lots and lots of publicity. Um, I think that many, many South Africans became aware of the, the plight of Camphastam flamingos. And if anything, the event early last year certainly raised the profile of flamingos, not only in South Africa, but also globally. And there were a lot of rehabilitation facilities that were involved in the, this work. And there's just some of them. Hopefully all of them, and you know, well done to them. Some of them, uh, we were able to raise some funding from our members and from our bird clubs, and we assisted some of these uh, facilities with uh, contributions. And there were lots and lots of sponsors, and that's as comprehensive a list as uh, Tanya could put together of all of the many, many sponsors that um, rallied together and provided sort of support for this, this work that was undertaken. Okay, it's been interesting just to look at the sort of timeline of events um, and the numbers of birds that were um, rescued, reared, and released. And, uh, you know, we hope that these figures are accurate. I think to our, the best of our knowledge, they are. 2,043 flamingos um, were rescued, as you can see there. 550, which is about 26%, were subsequently released into Campus Dam. Now, that's about 10% of the wild birds that we looked after, Bird Life South Africa looked after, if I put it that way, that successfully fledged. So 64% died of the flamingos died in captivity. In other words, died while they were while they were being reared. I think lots of the deaths were the initial stages. And I have to say that if there was ever going to be a rescue operation again, I think a lot has been learned, and I think the success would be significantly greater in future. There's also been mortalities of released flamingos. We know of those mortalities, but of course, you know, many, many of those um, would not be detected. They've, they've dispersed across the country and you know the carcasses would just um, decay very quickly and also predators and scavengers would consume them. There's still 195 in captivity and we we be hoping and I think the between Bird Life South Africa and the, the community of flamingo fowls in Kimberley would like to see those birds returned soon. In fact um, should have been returned a while ago. The flamingo is present at the Laurie Park Zoo, Monte Cassino and the National Zoological Gardens in Pretoria. We're not sure how many they have. We do know that some of them are pox virus. We're not sure about the extent of um, birds that are infected with this virus, also whether things have been improved over time. There are a few, probably a couple of dozen, that are physically impaired and non-releasable. Now, 76 birds were due to be released in March. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. Okay, the, um, this has caused reason for concern, and A.B. Abrams, the, my ex, my former colleague, um, and Probably one of the most dedicated and hardworking and passionate conservationists I know. He's now the Director of Biodiversity Management at um, Department of Environment and Nature Conservation. Wrote to these facilities in November last year and literally instructed them to return the birds um, to Kimberley. This hasn't happened subsequently. And uh, a few days ago, we received a correspondence from um, Mr. Abrams. And I've actually copied some of it. At, at the, Correspondence is in the public domain now, so I've got no hesitation to share it with you. But AB didn't mince his words in this correspondence, saying that the permits were issued with the understanding that flamingos would be returned to Campus Dam. He told these facilities you have not complied with the um, conditions of the permit. He said that his request for them to be returned has been met with lots of hostility. And he understands the reason for the refusal to return them is um, because there's been plan to start a captive breeding facility at um, facilities in Gauteng. He also said in his, in his letter that there's no cooperation from the facilities in Gauteng, and he's now going to refer this matter to law enforcement agencies. And I think, I think a lot of the people who are involved in the rescue release, rescue rearing and release are, are attending this webinar, and I, I have to take my hat off and thank you for all you've done, because I know that many of you work day and night, and um, sacrificed family time and, and money to support the rescue, rearing and release. And I think it must sadden you to see the fact that um, some of the birds haven't been returned and, and this is not my opinion, but the opinion of, of A.B. Abrams, who's the Director of Biodiversity Management in Northern Cape, who as I said, is a very, very committed conservationist, that these birds have been held in Gauteng and have not um, been returned to where they belong. Very, very sad this is the case. Okay, there's uh, my flamingo again, and uh, these birds from Gauteng should return there and join them. Here's just a summary of the breeding events over the years. 
For 2007, 2008, 9,000 chicks. The following year, 13,000 and then fewer. Subsequent two years when the island flooded, that period in the middle there, 2012 to 2016, where they, and they didn't breed because the island, um, the dam was dry. They bred in the shoreline in 2017, 18, 8,000 chicks, 5,800 the following year. They have actually bred this last summer as well with fewer chicks being produced. We estimate about 2,000, but those numbers aren't that accurate. This is a very important site for flamingos, for lesser flamingos in particular, with climate change, lower rainfall in the Toshapan catchment. We expect breeding to take place less frequently there. Suapan also has its problems. Lake Natron has its problems. Unfortunately, this kind of um, management intervention is necessary, but we have to get things right at Campus Dam. So we have a number of challenges. Um, the sewage water is a big challenge. The water is of very poor quality, been untreated for the last few years. I mean, it's actually amazing that Salt Lake Municipality would get away with pumping un totally untreated water into Campus Dam. Thankfully, some of the water flows through Pragmites reed beds, and there's some degree of um, filtering of some of the nutrients and, and, uh, out of the water. Campus Dam remains unprotected, and I think something we need to think about in future. There's also the disturbance, dogs and people entering from the western side, um, people, tourists, photographers, you know, coming close to the birds from the, the eastern side. Collisions with overhead cables persist, although Transnet has now been doing some work to mark those cables, and we do thank them for that. There's also the problem of potential future housing developments. And then, you know, we've been proposing for a long time that some ecotourism facilities are put up, you know, are hired and elevated to hide to allow people that travel on the M12 and allow visitors to Kimberley access to the site. They can actually watch and, um, and photograph um, the flamingos. And, you know, despite proposals being developed and funds being raised, this unfortunately has never been realized. So, you know, we think the sun hasn't set on, on campus diamonds, flamingos, and BirdLife South Africa in particular, with the support of Ecarpa Mining and others, remains committed to ensure that the dam and its birds are conserved. And before my last few slides about BirdLife South Africa, I'd just like to thank um, the many, many people that have been involved in this project. And I hope that that list is comprehensive. I'm sure there are a number of people that have provided support are listening on this, to this webinar. I'd like to thank you all. And um, there were obviously in my previous slides, there were people involved in the rescue and the rearing. I haven't acknowledged them all here, but um, most of these people have been involved from way back when, from uh, in the last 30 years. And I think those who are interested in the conservation of Campus Dam and its flamingos need to think that beyond the rescue operation, there's a lot more that needs to be done. We need to ensure the long-term future of this important site. And, and we need support, um, whether it's funding or you know, a louder voice to ensure that the, the threats are addressed and um, that we can secure the site for the future of lesser flamingos. And then lastly, I think I have three slides. Campus Dam is important. BirdLife South Africa is very involved in ensuring that it's protected. We, we remain committed. As I said, Robin Kalein is developing these remote methods for monitoring the food in the water and also, and also for counting the flamingos. And um, we're now doing a study just to determine all the legal, all the laws that Salt Lake municipalities in contravention of. We have um, our own in-house lawyer and we're working with a, a volunteer lawyer, one of the most experienced environmental lawyers in the country. And we will plan to come up with um, some idea of, of the legislation they're in contravention of and we can then approach the authorities and say, that, you know, it's now time that you act, acted and, and did something. And I'd like to encourage those who aren't uh, members of BirdLife South Africa to consider supporting us. Not only do we care about flamingos, but we care about a whole host of other bird species. And we have a, a really big job. And as a donor-funded NGO, particularly during time, the time of COVID-19, we have our challenges. And the, the, you know, the smallest thing you can do is become a member of our organization and your membership helps us have a louder voice, also provided some much needed funding for the work that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. That was an absolutely fascinating history into the amazing conservation of campus dams, less of flamingos. And I really do appreciate you coming on to Conservation Conversations and sharing that wonderful story with us. Um, before we get to questions, I just want to remind everybody that uh, there will be a little survey popping up on your screens as you exit the webinar tonight. Please take a few seconds just to complete it for us. It does help us 
get some feedback on the webinars to help bringing you good quality events every Tuesday night. Next week, Reason Yangera will be sharing his experiences at sea, working with local fishermen to save our threatened seabirds from bycatch. This is a great follow-up talk to Andrea Angel's talk from a few weeks back about the Albatross Task Force. And I would highly recommend watching Andy's webinar on YouTube before next week if you haven't had a chance to have a look at it yet. But be sure to tune in with us from 7 p.m. next week, Tuesday. Now, if you'd like to get some questions to Mark, you can type those into the Q&A box on Zoom. And for those of you tuning in through Facebook Live, you can drop your questions into the Facebook Live comment feed. And I know Mark is quite happy to start tackling some of the questions. Um, he's asked if he can run through them himself. So Mark, I'm gonna hand over to you if you wanna start tackling some of those questions. Okay, so Ronnie Glass has asked a few questions about the flamingos at Duhup. Um, I know that greater flamingos are bred at Duhup, um, Ronnie. I don't have much information about them. But I know the flamingos do frequent um, Duhup flay, and obviously also at Volfus Bay, where there's a fairly large population of flamingos. But uh, one of the, you know, a really good question you've asked is, you know, why they chose Camphus Dam. It used to be an ephemeral pan. So it's not a dam. There's no dam wall. It's called a, falsely called a dam. It's actually a pan. But uh, it became perennial, permanent, um, when the, the municipality started pumping its uh, treated, um, lately untreated sewage water into the dam. And um, this nutrient enrichment provided the Dugan algae, um, the cyanobacteria on which the flamingos breed, and hence them making use of the site. Um, Mervyn Wetmore asked about building another island. Um, that is a possibility. There was also a question about fixing um, rebuilding the current island, that is also a possibility. But there are, there is another proposal for another, there's another suggestion of, of an alternative to an island as well, which um, perhaps a story for another day. Um, Eleanor Mary's asked a couple of questions, but I think most of those have been answered. Um, Eleanor Mary. And then um, Penny Abbott has asked a very really good question about why the birds breed regularly at Campus Dam in comparison to the nine year intervals at other sites. Penny, this has a lot to do with inundation of those sites. So the um, Campus Dam is perennial, permanent, um, and Tosha Pan doesn't receive water very regularly. And in fact, less and less irregularly with um, lower rainfall, possibly due to climate change. Then uh, Eleanor Mary asks about the housing development. Um, is it, has it been abandoned or is it still a possibility? And it's not on the Booth's land, it's actually adjacent to their property, Eleanor Mary. But the environmental authorization that the company was given has now expired. So hopefully that project will never take place. Also, all the negative publicity they received, I don't think they'd ever want to hold a housing development at um, Campus Town, well, at Kimberley. So that project has <clears throat> been discarded, but there have been suggestions for other housing developments um, elsewhere in the area, and some of them probably less of an impact. Okay, somebody asked how long, long flamingos live. I think that they can live for 40 years plus. In fact, there's a record of them even living longer than that. And um, Tanya, who's more knowledgeable on the subject than me, is saying it is a bird that lived for 63 years. And I think that was a greater, a lesser flamingo. So 63 years, believe it or not. Okay. Um, there's um, a question about the diet when hand rearing chicks. Um, Sigrid, I'm probably not the right person to answer that. And maybe somebody else um, would be prepared to type that answer into the chat room as well. It's not some um, an area that I have much expertise in. <clears throat> There's a question about the Flamingo Casino, whether they support the Flamingo Project. They have in the past. Um, I think there could probably be more support. <laughs> it would be, certainly be nice um, if they did. Jane, I don't know much about flamingos at the Cape Town Sewage Works or the Salt Pans in Swaka Point. But what I can tell you is that um, flamingos move around extensively, and Tanya has actually been collating all of the information about sightings of flamingos recently. There were breeding events this summer at Etosha and Suapan. So all three of the localities in Southern Africa are breeding um, birds, and they've dispersed widely. And because a large, or a fair number have been ringed now, color ringed, and also have um, been satellite tracked. We've got some really better information about the um, movements. And Pamela, thanks very much for your kind uh, words, uh, your kind compliment, thank you. Okay, and then um, Lindsay van Renefeldt has commented about uh, Langebaan Lagoon. 
where flamingos are present all year round. Um, yeah, and I think because it's a permanently inundated wetland, I think that's why they use it. It's mainly graters there, Lindsay, and I think a few lessons. And last year we were there and um, spent some time in the hides photographing them. It's, uh, if anybody wants to get up close to greater flamingos, Longabarn Lagoon is the place to go. Okay, I'm just looking more at some of the questions. Okay, so then also um, Anne Todd is it is asking a really um, important question too. Is the flamingos are the burger of estuary at felt drift, but they don't breed there. Why don't they breed? Yes, they don't breed there. Um, and we've often wondered what why they have bred at Campus Dam and not elsewhere. Um, for example, the Velcom pants. They you know they need to be free of disturbance, we think is important. So the island was the encouragement at Campus Dam that blocked them breeding. I think that was important. They also need to be present in large numbers. We think it's a critical number that they need to achieve before they will breed. And that's probably in tens of thousands. And, and then importantly, they need food and they need you know, really vast quantities of food in which they, they feed. They are able to fly to you know, other wetlands and return and feed the chicks. They feed them um, crop milk. Um, so there's a secretions produced by glands in the, um, the esophagus. And actually drip this crop milk into the beak of the, the the chicks. It's really interesting to watch. And they will stand for about 10 minutes, even longer, over the chicks, just dripping this crop milk into the, the chicks' um, beak. Really nice um, to see. But I think, yeah, it's got to do with the number of birds being present, tens of thousands, um, and lots of food, and also a, a site that's free of um, disturbance. So I think, I don't know if I'm missing any, Melissa, maybe there's some that you see. Um, Jane Rogers said there was two lesser flamingos at Waterfall Country Village Dam in June for a few days. Moving around, I presume, Jane. And um, in fact, just in the last few weeks, we've got lots and lots of um, records of flamingos all over the place. And they could be moving between different localities. We know that they do move across to um, Mozambique, and um, they're probably stopping over places on the way. They do obviously move across to um, Namibia as well, so stopping along the way there too. So you're not much is known about these movements, partly because the birds um, fly at night. And it was always amazed me is how they turn up at some of these localities. When I was based in the Northern Cape, working for nature conservation, at the times get farmers from Bushman land, you know, the Puff other area phone me and say that you know, there's water in their pan. There's been water in the pan for four or five days. It's a localized rainfall event and there's now a hundred greater flamingos. Where did they come from? Yeah, no idea. <laughs> so, and how they're able to determine that they fly in that direction and there will be food available. Paul Buckley, um, my colleague from, uh, ex colleague from the RSPB in the UK, has asked, What is the future for the island? Do you think the birds might return to the island is, um, if it's repaired? We do think so, um, Paul, um, and uh, it's something that we'd, we'd certainly um, consider in future. So, yeah, certainly uh, something that we will think about, Paul. Long time no see, um, Paul. Okay, so, a, sorry, but it's a good. We've got a question from you in Outram, Mark, asking if there's any evidence of flamingos favoring a nesting area depending on where they hatched from, or do they move off to different locations? We don't know. Um, so, so Tonya's going to help me maybe with that answer, but um, yeah, we, we, we know there's a lot that we will learn. I think with having a large number of birds um, ring, maybe some of those answers will, um, some of those questions could be answered. So Donovan um, Smith, who's the veterinarian in Kimberley, who's really him and Esther, one of Esther's and Cots have been, yeah, been the stalwarts behind this project in the last 18 months, is asking what can the public do to help with conservation. Donovan, um, sure. And it's a difficult one. Um, we're not really sure, and we hope to convene a workshop sometime in Kimberley, and of course you'll be integral to that. One of the things we thought of doing is actually building a fence along the um, western boundary of the dam next to the railway line to at least exclude access um, to the site. Because disturbance, as you well know, um, is, is a huge problem. So maybe people could donate to the wards the cost of the, the fence. We thought maybe a crowdfunding appeal would bring in the money that would be needed. And then also um, potentially a, a petition, um, Donovan, maybe that's something we'd have to look at in the future as well to actually try and get more support because we, we're not getting government support as, as you well know, Donovan. Um, OK, 
Okay. So thanks for some of the kind words. I see um, my good friend Rick Nuttall from Bloemfontein is um, very complimentary of the work that we've done. Asha Pardley Pardy has asked whether the Flamingo webcam is active. No, it's not. Um, in fact, it wasn't damaged during the flooding. We actually went across and rescued it. It's probably locked up in some store, store room at a copper mining, so something we could certainly reinstate in future, I should say. I mean, it was, the images were just remarkable. And um, we would love to enable people to see the birds as they were breeding. So there's a question from Eleanor Mary again about where to position the bird hide. We actually thought um, adjacent to the N12, the main road, Eleanor Mary, and raised um, so that people could look over the, the railway line and over the cables would be what we had in mind. And in fact, BirdLife South Africa received some funding we, and Martin Taylor, BirdLife South Africa's Martin Taylor drew up a proposal for the construction of this hide. There a lot of work went into that. But, uh, and some funding was available. And I think it was both Northern Cape government and municipality funding, but I think there were other priorities and the money was, uh, was no longer available. So. Okay, I think we've covered most. Um, Melissa, I think we're kind of running out of time, are we? Uh, getting there, Mark. Yeah, we've got one more question from Lungile. Um, and Lungile is asking, what gives the lesser flamingo those peach colored feathers? Okay, so that's the pigment in the food, uh, Lungile. So that's where they receive the, the, um, the, the coloring. And um, I mean, there's a lot to learn about that as well, because the color varies. When they're non breeding, they're actually paler. And as we observed at Campus Dam, obviously there's some physiological processes that are underway that they obviously they're able to synthesize those pigments or convert them into um, that pink color um, when they are breeding, which um, which is very interesting. And uh, yeah, it's a sure sign that the birds are either about to breed, are breeding, or just bred by the extent of the um, coloration, the pink coloration. Shashi also asked about whether borehole water could be used during the dry periods. So I don't think that. Um, you know, the lack of water is too much of a problem. Um, I think the, the water is available because Kimberley is processing lots of um, sewage water. And in fact, at times, it was, you know, as you know from the flooding, there was excess water and that was actually pumped away to, through a pipeline that was constructed, I think with funding from the development bank, to another pan um, north of Campus Dam. And um, that um, pipeline, I don't think has been really used to the extent that we liked it to, to have been used. But the water is, the amount of water is not the problem. I think it's just the management of the water that is the issue. And Crazy V3 engineers, at least 15 years ago, did a study and advised the Salt Pike municipality on how they should manage the water to ensure that there was um, not too much water and not too little, manage it to, to benefit um, the flamingos. And I've always thought that it is up to the, the people of Kimberley and particularly the, the government authorities to decide whether they want flamingos at Campus Dam and how important this population of flamingos are, and whether they are a tourism attraction and then manage Campus Dam to ensure that that population um, is maintained. So um, Priscilla Beaton, who's the chair of Cape Bird Club, has asked about um, the nutrient rich water. Is the water in Campus Dam nutrient rich because of the sewage? Exactly. Um, Priscilla, and you know, you asked a really good question, and one we don't have an answer for. In fact, is that you know, what quality water does one need to maintain that those uh, blue green algae? So too clean wouldn't be good, um, and too nutrient enriched um, probably wouldn't be good either. So we're not sure um, about that, and something I think that certainly deserves um, a lot more work. Um, we have an expert, Dr. Jan Ruiz, has been doing all of our water, quality analysis, water quality, quality analyses over the last 15 years. He is an authority on the um, on algae and something that maybe he could put a bit more work into and help advise on that. Yeah. Mark, we've got a question on Facebook coming from Yopi Kuhn, who's um, head of the aviary at San Diego Zoo all the way in the States. It's lovely to have him tuning in, but he's asking, it's obviously very hard to monitor chick mortalities, but is there any idea how the mortality rate for chicks was the year of the rescue compared to other years? We've got no idea, um, but I can tell you, I mean, obviously the mortality of the rescue chicks is quite high, as I mentioned, and that's because I think we were still learning about flamingo rearing at that stage. 
Um, the, the reared chicks would always be compromised to some extent, and I think the, there were probably mortalities of the release birds, although those, some of those that have been fitted with satellite tracking devices and have been ringed, they've been turning up around the country. So clearly, you know, a number of them are surviving. But the 5,200 chicks that weren't rescued, which we monitored for a few months, and which then fled successfully, the survival was you know, almost 100%. There was almost no mortalities, and we you know we were counting those birds using remote methods and um, you know, and looking out for dead birds. Those birds survived. So, yeah, the the, the adults are very good at at rearing and looking after their their babies, and you know that's really what needs to happen. I think that mass mortalities or abandonment of breeding events is not something which is uncommon or unnatural. I think it's Serpan and Botswana and even Lake Natron in Tanzania. At times, I would, would imagine that tens of thousands of chicks are abandoned when the, the pan or lake um, dries up. And it's just a, a natural thing, unfortunately. Not very nice. And, but I do think that you know, this rescue last year was undertaken. There were certainly some benefits. Some birds have survived. But as I mentioned earlier, the awareness that was created for flamingos, um, both nationally and globally, has been absolutely important. And I don't think the... the um, we would have had that success unless the birds had been rescued and received the publicity it did from around the world. Absolutely. I see uh, we've got a comment from our honorary patron, Pamela Isdell, saying that we need to work towards a dedicated flamingo person. That would be wonderful, Pamela. And let's hope that Pamela, can come online one uh, day. <laughs> Pamela, a great suggestion. And you know, she's actually sitting here right next to me. <clears throat> and Pamela and I have spoken <laughs> a lot about flamingos. And I, you know, when I'm the most wonderful things I did was actually show Pamela Neville Estill the, the Lesser Flamingos um, a number of years ago, 2013. We visited um, Kimberley together and um, went to look for Artfark, which is one of Neville's nemesis mammals. We got to see Artfark and um, we went and saw the flamingos. And in fact, I think they flew in a helicopter as well and they had a bird's eye view of flamingos. But we do need a dedicated flamingo person and not only for South Africa, but the continent as well. So I think, you know, BirdLife South Africa, Pamela is doing a lot of the work at the moment um, with support, um, particularly from the folk in Kimberley, Donovan and, and Esther in particular. And um, but there is certainly scope for, for more capacity. Absolutely. Great, Mark. I think we've managed to get to the end of our question session. So well done on an absolutely fantastic presentation. And thank you so much for giving up your Tuesday night to join all of us on Conservation Conversations. And I look forward to seeing everyone same time again next week, Tuesday. Keep those eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds and keep safe, everybody. We live in uncertain and dangerous times. So take care of yourselves and I will see you all again, same time, same place next week. Thanks, Mark, and good night, everyone. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks for everybody who attended. Good night, everybody. And I have to say before we start, um, Melissa's done an outstanding job with these Conservation Conversations webinars. Um, she proposed this to me just at the start of lockdown. And um, I said, yes, it'd be fantastic. Let's do it. And obviously wanted to be really professional. And you know, she took that to heart. And uh, it's been significantly more professional than when I could have ever imagined. So well done to you, Melissa, on, on all this great work. We've reached such a, a huge number of people and an audience that we generally haven't been able to reach over time. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the kind words and thanks for trusting me with this exciting opportunity. It's been a lot of fun putting these together and certainly a wonderful learning experience for me and everyone else who's been attending. So I hope we can continue bringing a little bit of sunshine to everyone's lockdown on Tuesday nights. Um, yeah, we're not sure how much longer this is going to go for, but we'll be here until the end of this year, at least every week. So uh, yeah, stay tuned every Tuesday night. <laughs>